Hi everyone, my name is Makeda Robinson and welcome to my channel, Our New Viral World. I know there's a lot of information out there circulating about COVID-19, but I wanted to share my perspective on the great research that's being done to help stop the virus. I'm a physician scientist. I have my MD and PhD from Stanford University, and I study specifically infectious diseases, as well as emerging viruses, such as COVID-19, both in the clinic as well as in the lab. I've been getting a lot of great questions from friends and family about how they can protect themselves and others from transmission of this virus. Um, and I just really wanted to have a broader discussion outside of academia about what we're learning from some of the papers that are coming out uh, more recently. So today, I'm going to talk about some of the non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs that have been impacting a lot of our lives recently. And all of the opinions and discussion here are my own. So what are non-pharmaceutical interventions? They include isolation of known COVID-19 cases, the quarantine of contacts of that known case, social distancing, and closure of schools and universities. An implementation of these policies relies on an ethical term called the harm principle, where individual autonomy can be curtailed to prevent harm and injury to others. Today, I'm going to talk about a paper that looks at the impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions on reduction of COVID-19 mortality or death and healthcare demands. So this paper discusses the distinction between interventions which will lead to the mitigation versus the suppression of the virus. So mitigation strategies are those that will slow the spread and most importantly will protect at-risk populations such as elderly people. Suppressive policies will lead to the reduction or reversal of the epidemic growth of the virus. So an important concept to understand here is the reproduction number or the r naught. It's a fairly simple idea where it's the number of infections generated from one case. So for example, Ebola has an r naught of 1.5 to 2.5. The H1N1 influenza had an r naught of 1.4 to 2.8. And measles, which we know to be incredibly infectious, has an R-naught of 12 to 18. Um, we're still learning a lot about COVID-19, but most of the literature is showing that COVID-19 has an R-naught of around two to three. So one infected COVID-19 patient will infect at least two patients. And so when thinking about mitigation and suppression strategies, a mitigation strategy is simply trying to reduce that number from two to say maybe 1.5, where suppression strategies are trying to reduce the R naught to less than one. Next, the authors looked at the severity of COVID-19 infection by age group using data that they obtained from China. And as you can see, the number of cases requiring hospitalization, critical care, um, higher levels of care, as well as fatality rates increase with age. Interestingly, this virus does not appear to disproportionately uh, affect younger or patients or children. The authors then calculated the number of deaths that would occur if we did absolutely nothing. So if we did none of, so if none of these MPIs were implemented, uh, what would happen? Um, and in Great Britain, they calculated that around half a million people would likely die, and in the U.S., uh, around 2.2. Um, and the U.S. number uh, peaks a little bit later and is a little bit broader, um, which is thought to be due just to the difference in the geographical um, landmass of the U.S. They then looked at the effect of mitigation strategies on healthcare demand, which is listed here as the number of critical care beds that are occupied per 100,000 people in the population. This number, uh, the number of critical care beds in the UK versus the US is a little bit different. So in Great Britain, it's around eight per 100,000, and in the US, it's a little bit higher, so 25 to 30. So you can just imagine this red line being slightly higher in the US. Uh, and as you can see here on the side, they evaluated the effect of individual mitigation strategies as well as those in combination to lower the healthcare demands. Um, and we see here that the best combination is case isolation, home quarantine, and social distancing of our vulnerable population or our elderly patients greater than 70. However, 
Um, regardless of the combination of mitigation strategies put in place, you can see here that the number of critical care beds will be exceeded um, around mid to late April. However, the most ideal combination of mitigation strategies would lead to a reduction in mortality rates by around 50% and healthcare demands by two thirds. So can we do better? They then looked at the effect of suppression strategies on healthcare demands. And we get some better news here. So if we implement suppression strategies for a total of five months, you can see here that if we combine school and university closure, case isolation, and general social distancing of everyone in our communities, the number of critical care beds uh, available will not be exceeded. However, I think it's very important to look farther down the line uh, where we see a secondary peak. And this would be after these suppression strategies are relaxed. So it's very important for us to realize that without a higher level of herd immunity, there will likely be a secondary peak of viral transmission. So what is herd immunity? It's the resistance to the spread of a contagious disease such as a virus within a population due to previous infection or vaccination. And this provides an indirect protection to those who are not immune. So this idea really leads to a better understanding of why a vaccine is so important. Because without it, there will likely be a secondary peak um, after these strategies are relaxed. So lastly, the authors talk about an adaptive strategy. So this is sort of an on and off switch where the non-pharmaceutical interventions would be turned on and then they'd be turned off once the number of weekly critical care cases reduces below a certain number and that those NPIs would then be turned back on once there, we're seeing a rise in ICU cases. And here they estimate that if we implemented this adaptive strategy for a total of two years, um, we would likely need these NPIs in place two thirds of the time. So to give you just a quick summary of some of the findings from this paper, it's very clear that we need a combination of interventions in order to stop the spread of this virus. Suppressive strategies are really crucial. However, we all know that there will be large economic and social impacts to implementation of these MPIs. The largest impact, uh, in, the largest impact we can really make in healthcare usage and mortality rates is population level social distancing. So please really remember that the actions that we're taking can really start to flatten the curve. And lastly, without a viable vaccine, there will likely be a second peak of transmission after relaxing these restrictions. So, so for my next episode, I wanna talk about some of the progress and efforts that have been made towards vaccine development and how close we are to a viable vaccine. Um, and just to give you some other things to think about, other countries such as South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan have actually showed slowing of the outbreak without full lockdown. Some of these countries were, were much harder hit by the initial SARS outbreak, as well as another coronavirus outbreak, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And this may have led to them being more responsive to the initial outbreak. Um, and it's known that places like South Korea were very, were very aggressive about early diagnosis and isolation of cases. Um, and so I think these are interesting thoughts to think about for um, you know, thinking about future outbreaks. Great, so thank you all for your time and attention. I want to leave you with a few references if you're interested in looking into some of these concepts more deeply. Um, and please leave any questions below.